So the, um, we're continuing a series which we started last week on the authentic Christian. What does it mean to be authentic? What does it mean to be the real deal? And the topic I was given this week is the authentic Christian and sin. So we're going to be thinking about sin this morning. Um, I thought about wearing black, but then as I was preparing this, this talk, I was realizing <clears throat> there is so much to celebrate about what God has done for us. So we're going to be talking about that. But it can be a source of confusion when we think about being a follower of Jesus and sin. Like, I'm still struggling with things in my life. Um, perhaps I'm not the real deal. I wonder if I've really been saved when I've got this thing that's kind of clinging on to me. Maybe you're thinking, um, I'm really glad people don't know what I'm really like. If they knew what I really thought and some of the things I really did, then uh, that would be terrible. So I'm glad people don't really know me. And so we're coming to this letter which John wrote. Now, John was one of the disciples of Jesus. And when he wrote this letter, he was a very old man. So he'd been with Jesus for three years, walking around with Jesus. And he says at the beginning of his letter, we were with him. We looked at him, we heard him, we touched him. He's not making this up. He's been with Jesus. He's an old man, been following Jesus for 60 years. And then in verse 5, just before what Sue read, he says, this is the message we've heard from him and we declare to you. So after 60 years, what's he going to say to us? There's something he wants to say. There's a message Jesus has given him which he's going to give to you. The message he wants to give is this, God is light. Got the verse. Oh, there's the title, The Authentic Christian in Sin. God is light in him. There is no darkness at all. Why is that so profound? Well, I think John, right at the beginning, he wants us to understand the universe that we live in. And when you look at the Bible, you look at the themes of the Bible, one of the main themes of the Bible, as you'll see, is there are two domains. There's the dom dominion of darkness, and then there's the kingdom of God. There's the dominion of darkness where Satan is the prince and he's the prince for a certain amount of time which we're living in right now. And there's the kingdom of God which is light. And so he's saying God is, dark, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. That is the theme of the whole Bible. That we're all born into this kingdom of darkness. But God's kingdom is coming. And when Jesus came... He told us to pray for the kingdom, and he brought the kingdom. And we're going to unpack that a little bit now. So there's the kingdom, of, there's the dominion of darkness, there's the kingdom of God. And Paul puts it like this in, in his letter to the Colossians. He says, if you are a follower of Jesus, this is true of you. He's rescued you from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. So when you became a Christian, when you were born again, whatever you want to call it, you were saved out of one kingdom and you were brought into another kingdom. That's the situation we're in. So there are these two kingdoms. Before we came into the kingdom, those of us that follow Jesus, before we came to the kingdom, the Bible says that we're all under God's wrath. Or if you're American, you're all under God's wrath. We're all under God's wrath. Well, wrath, what does wrath mean? Wrath just means extreme anger. So this is not the message we want to kind of hear, maybe not the message we want to take out to the world always, but actually the whole world is under God's wrath. It's under God's anger, extreme anger, because of sin. So as we come to this subject, we've got to take it seriously. This is not a minor issue, but it's actually central to our faith. Sin is our condition. It's not about making us feel bad about ourselves, but we really need to understand that God is disgusted with sin. So just to illustrate that, let me show you something. Now, if I was to invite you to my house on a hot day and you desperately want to drink a cold water and I pull out a bottle of water and I say, it's a bit dirty, it's actually from the toilet, okay, but it's water, you know, it'll uh, quench your thirst, have it, drink it. I don't think you would, would you? And sin is like that to God. 
Sin is saying, if I want to live in sin and offer myself to God, then I'm offering something that's polluted. It's disgusting to him. We cannot approach God with the sin that we have in us. Well, maybe you think, well, actually, I'm a pretty good person. I haven't really done much wrong. And so maybe you look a bit like this. There's only one teaspoon from the toilet in there. Okay, so it's not that bad, so maybe you'd want to drink this, okay? And so some people say, well, I'm trying to be a good person, so God should accept me into his heaven because I've been quite a good person. I've done some, a lot of good things. <clears throat> well, you're like this. You're still polluted. There's actually no difference between these two things. God will not accept someone who's polluted with sin. He's disgusted with it. So what is the good news of Jesus? Well, the good news of Jesus is that through his death and through his shedding of blood on the cross, he takes us, he empties us out, he washes us, and he fills us with himself. And now we stand clean. He puts a new label on us. The label that we now carry when we follow Jesus is child of God. I just want to correct, because some people think, well, everyone in the world is a child of God. The Bible doesn't say that. You're either an enemy of God or you're the child of God. And so what Jesus did for us, he brought us into this place where he washed us, he cleaned us, he filled us with himself. And that's how God sees us. So when we stand before God, everyone will stand before God one day. Some people will stand before God knowing that they're wicked and they never did anything about it. God is holy. He cannot accept them. Some will say, well, I have only done a few wrong things, but they're still polluted. And God will look at some, and when he looks at you, he'll look at Jesus. He sees Jesus' righteousness in you. So that's why sin is serious. It's not just a little matter. We are sick with sin. This is how the Bible understands it. But now that I'm clean, now that I'm standing in Jesus' righteousness, does this mean I'm a perfect person? Well, no. I think we all know that here, that actually none of us is perfect now that we've come to Jesus. So it's important that we understand we're in a battle, that this kingdom of darkness is still at work, working against us. We have an accuser who's working against us. So how can I be confident that I'm an authentic Christian? How can I be confident that I'm walking in the light? Well, maybe it's just a feeling, feeling confident, that actually I've dealt with a lot of things in my life and now I'm, I'm good. But John wants to tell us that confidence is not enough. Just feeling confident that God's going to accept you is not enough. See, John knew this. When John, who wrote this, this passage that we read, when he was a young man, you remember he was a disciple of Jesus, and he was so confident in himself, he came to Jesus one day, and he said, Jesus, can, uh, when you come into heaven, can me and my brother sit on your right and on your left? Because we're actually, you know, they, they kind of, we're, we're kind of important, so we want to sit in those places. And Jesus said, those are not my decisions, they're not your decisions. Three years of walking with Jesus had demolished John's confidence and his arrogance, his confidence in himself. <clears throat> the religious leaders in Jesus' time, they felt confident. They were probably a bit like this. They were confident, yeah, I'm a good person. One day, Nicodemus, a very religious man, a very upright religious man, came to Jesus and said, we know you're a good teacher. And Jesus said something to him which absolutely shocked him. Jesus said, unless someone is born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless you're born again, your state, you're in a terrible state. You need to be born again of the Spirit. So he said that to Nicodemus. So devotion to God and doing the, the religious stuff is not good enough. And there were others, other religious people that came to Jesus. And maybe even today, some of us have done great ministry for God. We've served God in this way and that way. We've even done miracles, maybe even cast out demons. What does Jesus say to them? 
some of the most chilling words of Jesus. Many will say to me on that day, the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did your name drive out demons and perform miracles? In other words, we're sorted. I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So, this is our condition. It's serious. <laughs> C.S. Lewis was right when he said, no one knows how bad they are until they've tried to be very, very good. I remember before I came to Jesus, I was a teenager, and I remember being so afraid of not, of, I was so afraid of hell that I tried to be really, really good. But my problem was I kept forgetting to be good. I went to school and I would cheat, I would lie. I was extremely rude to my older sister who was bossy. So we can't always be confident <laughs> that we can feel good about ourselves. You know, I want to be confident. How can we be confident when there's an enemy working against us? You see, Satan is very good at chucking things at us. He's chucking excuses and arguments about how, and enticing us to sin. I wrote down this week some of the things, the thoughts I've had in my mind over the years when I've been tempted some of these words. It's no big deal. It's only a little bit of pride. It's only a little lie. Or I can just have a little look and then I'll turn away. Or it's not really gossip when I'm saying something bad about something when they're not there. Or maybe Satan said to you as well, just this once, just do it this once and after that I'll stop. This is the last time I do it before we enter into some sin, or no harm will come of, it, come of it, or you can always repent afterwards, or even some that, are, that we probably hear more today than we've heard before. I'm different. I, I have an addictive personality. And so there's all these little whispers that God puts into people's minds and into their hearts to lead them into sin. And then as we know, anyone that's experienced this, as soon as you've fallen into sin, then Satan comes back again with some more words. Oh, now you've gone too far. There's no way back. There's no point, to, there's no point in repenting. You know you're going to do it again. So I'm sure many of you experience this. But John seems to be telling us that we can only know we're walking in the light when we humble ourselves, admitting we have a problem, when we have an honest confession of our sin, and trust in the blood of Jesus to wash us clean. This is the key verse I think he puts in the, in the passage that we read earlier. He says this, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I'm going to read that again. It's such a key verse for us to get into our hearts. This is a truth for all of us here. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So how do we confess well? Well, I think there are lots of ways you can confess well, but I've narrowed it down to three things about how to give a confession to God. Because we can come to God and we can apologize in bad ways. But the first thing is to take time to examine yourself. Take time with God to examine yourself. You see, sometimes there are things in my life I know that are invisible to me. Others see them, <laughs> but they're invisible to me. Um, even some uh, earlier this week, someone was pointing out something in me that they'd seen, which I don't think they liked. And I was completely unaware of it. I won't say what it was. Um, but... There are things that will be in our lives that we don't necessarily see. And uh, the things, these are the things that are sabotaging our walk with Jesus. So asking the Lord, is there anything in me that is not pleasing to you? See if there's any wicked way in me. Please reveal it. So what are the, what are the things in you? What are the things in you, the evil desires that you're enticed to and tempted to? Maybe we just take a few moments to think about that. What are some of the things in you? 
And I don't want you just to think about things in the sexual, spe sexual sphere. They're often the, th the first things that come to mind. But what about the respectable sins? Pride, putting yourselves before other people. Gluttony, the odd lie or exaggeration to, make you, to get you out of trouble or to make you look good. Maybe laziness, bitterness, envying what other people have got, judging others. I spent some time doing this this week and I realized that one of the things I, I, that is there in my life sometimes is self-pity, that I like to get people to feel sorry for me about some little thing here and there, rather than being thankful for what God has done for me. What are some of the things in you? So I'd encourage you to take time just to examine yourself, ask the Lord to shine his light on those areas of life that he wants to work on. You see, it's so important we see where sin is active. Where is the battle going on? It'll be different for each of us, but it's real for all of us. So don't think you're the only one. So confession well. Take time to examine. Ask the Lord to shine his light. The second one is this. How to confess well. Be honest and specific about your sin. You see, confession is laying bare your soul before God. That's what it is. It's agreeing with God. So it's not saying, I'm sorry, or sorry God, I messed up. It actually begins, confession, true confession begins by stating what I actually did. It's calling a spade a spade, as, as uh, we might put it. calling things out for what they actually are. You know, if you went to a doctor and you, you were feeling ill and the doctor looked to you and said, yes, I can confirm you're ill, it wouldn't be much use, would it? When you go to the doctor, you want the doctor to actually tell you what the illness is, what the problem is, what the root cause of it is, and then prescribe something to bring healing. So when we come to God, we're actually examining ourselves and saying, God, I've got this problem and it's this specific problem. God, I lied to make myself look good or I exaggerated. Father, I gossiped about Sam yesterday to make him look bad. Jesus, I find that I'm always complaining about things. Please help me have a thankful heart. Actually naming the things before God, it's so important in confession, in a true confession. Like I say, we've all seen apologies done wrong, and sometimes we get our kids to do it, don't we? Like one kid is snatches something off another kid, and we say, say sorry. And so the kids say, sorry. I say, no, say it properly. Sorry. Okay. That kid is not sorry. The other kid's more sorry, actually. They're sorry that they got hit or that they got their toy snatched from them. So a true confession is actually a heartfelt confession before God, coming to him in repentance. I did this, the specific thing, I gossiped, I lied, I complained. What I did was pride, forgive me, Lord. And that's where the healing comes, when we actually call it for what it is. That's where God can do his work in our life. So take time to examine yourself. Be honest and specific about your sin. And the third thing is no blame, no excuses. Take responsibility for your sin. These are things that I've learned over the years. Take responsibility. True confession doesn't make excuses or blame others. Lord, I, I did this, but I have a special weakness in that area. Kind of making an excuse. Or... Yeah, I was provoked. I'm sorry I said that, but they had it coming to them. That's not a confession of sin. That's just finding an excuse for what you did. Yes, Lord, I exaggerated that healing story, that healing story a little bit, but it was to inspire other Christians to pray for healing. Do you see how subtle these things can be sometimes? God doesn't need us to lie to make him look good. In fact, he hates it. It's like filthy toilet water. 
No, a true confession takes ownership and says, I sinned, no excuses. So what does God do when we confess our sins? Well, to go back to that verse, I'll have to go back a few slides. If we confess our sins, what will God do? He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We need to memorize this verse. I memorized it when I was a a young man, and it's been so useful for me. Because so often, like I say, the enemy will come in and he'll just put this kind of burden or, or a coat of guilt on you for what you've done. And we need to remind ourselves constantly in our hearts that this, this is the truth. If we confess our sins, okay, what's the truth? He is faithful and just. God is faithful and just. He will forgive us our sins and he will purify us. He'll cleanse us. He'll make us like this. Okay, this is our position before him. He will cleanse us when we confess our sins. He'll purify us from all unrighteousness. And I think so many Christians are walking around with this kind of lead coat of guilt that they're carrying for things that they've done. And and then that perpetuates the problem where we continue in our sin. No, let's believe the truth of that. We need to declare it in our hearts. We also need to declare it to one another. I have a couple of guys that I meet with every now and then, and we share, we share things from the heart, we share our lives, and we do so in confidentiality. And we can even confess our sins to one another, knowing that we can trust one another. And it's good that you would have one or two other people, one or two other Christians in your life that you can go that deep with, that you can trust that much. So I wonder, do you have anyone? If not, I'd encourage you to find someone. Ask the Lord to show you someone. Who is it? Who is a friend that I can trust, that I can tell, confess my sins to? And they, when I'm carrying this guilt, this lead coat of guilt, when I'm carrying it, they can say, no, you've confessed your sin. You are forgiven. You are clean because of what Jesus has done for you. And this is what walking in the light is. Walking in the light is not carrying that coat of sin. It's calling out sin for what it is. There are two jobs you need to do when you recognize sin in your life after confession. One is to kill it, to kill that sin. The only permission we have for violence in the New Testament that I can see, maybe someone's seen something I haven't, there's only one permission to be violent. And that's to put to death your sinful nature, to kill it. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. There's a verse that says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature. Crucifixion is a very cruel way to kill something. They've crucified it. You know, if you hit a deadly snake with a gentle little stroke, you'll probably regret that you decided to take that snake on. With sin in our lives, let's act early, act often, act violently towards that sin to cut it off. There will be certain issues that we're dealing with, and this is a big, big topic. (laughs) I'm only covering it very lightly today, but there'll be certain issues in our lives that actually we need outside help to deal with. It'll take more than just confession more than just asking forgiveness, there's things that have got a hold on us where we can get some outside help. And that's one of the beautiful things of the church is you're in here with people that are for you, people that understand you, because we're all in the same boat, and we can get help in that way. So kill that sin that's in your life. But the second thing is this, and this is what makes us different to the rest, to to those that are outside the kingdom. See, outside of the kingdom, you have to go to self-help books, But because of Christ in us, and us in Christ, we can surrender to God's transforming work in our life. You cannot do this alone. (laughs) You cannot beat sin in your life alone. We surrender to God's transforming work in our life. God has begun a good work in you. I think that's why you're here this morning. God's begun a good work in you. 
and he will complete it. He will carry it on if you surrender to him. The power of the Spirit is available to us today to defeat sin in our lives. So I'm going to invite the band back up. We're going to close with a song talking about the marvelous, wonderful love of Jesus that he hasn't left us in our filth, but he's taken us and he's cleaned us. Let's pray. Yeah. Let's stand. Sorry, let's stand. Maybe close your eyes. If you want to, just lift your hands before God in response to him. Holy Spirit, you're here, and we want to say thank you that you reveal sin in our lives. We thank you, Jesus, that you shed your blood, that we can be clean. Thank you, Father, that you welcome us when we return to you. Thank you that we can know we are children of God because of what you've done for us and because of your ongoing work in us. Thank you, Father. As we sing this final song, I also want to invite the prayer team to come up. And if you want to come forward during this song, maybe you want prayer this morning. Maybe you're here this morning because you're overcome by sin. And you want strength to deal with it. Come and get prayer for that. Maybe there's someone who's very close to you, who you know is under the weight of sin and dealing with things in their lives. Maybe they know Christ, maybe they don't. And maybe you want prayer for them. Come and get prayer for them. There's power in our prayers. Or maybe you just want to come forward and receive a blessing from God this morning. So prayer is available to you. So let's sing our praises to God. Let's receive from him as we close our service.